And why does my heart feel lonely? It longs for heaven and home. When Jesus sees my portion. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches so I see. I sing because I'm free. Yeah, his eye is on the spell. 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Skokie Valley Baptist Church. We are so happy to have you here worshiping with us. Whether you're joining us online or if you're here in the sanctuary, won't you please stand as we worship together?
seated. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Ben. I'm the youth pastor here at the church, and I just want to welcome you this morning. It's a privilege to get to worship with you and shout Hosanna to the, the conquering King Jesus who saves, who we remember this morning. If you happen to be visiting us for the first time, special welcome to you, whether that's online or here in the sanctuary. We'd love to know you're here. There's a card in front of you. Fill that out. Take it out to the welcome desk. Out on your left as you're leaving, they can answer any questions as well as give you a little gift for being here with us this morning, and that'll help us be able to catch up with you and, and check in with you this week. That same card, that same link, there's there in the YouTube description there for those online. Great opportunity for all of you to write down any praise or prayer requests you'd have this week. We'd love the chance to pray with you this week. This is a holy week. It's, it's the most important week on the calendar for us here as Christians. And so I just want to make sure we all are aware of what's going on this week so we can come together and uh, worship God together. And that's going to start with a Good Friday service. That's going to be this coming Friday at 7 p.m. We're going to reflect on the, the last seven sayings of Jesus as well as take communion together. So make sure you mark your calendar for that. Come on out. That will be a, a great time of reflection and uh, just pondering what Jesus did for us on the cross. On Saturday of this coming week, uh, this coming Saturday, the 30th, we have our egg hunt in the morning starting at 10.30 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m., sorry. I've got to remember the right time and show up, show up at the right time. Uh, but that's for all ages. We're going to have eggs hidden all throughout the church, hopefully in the backyard. Uh, we're going to have a special area down here along this hallway for preschool and underage groups so you could find eggs with uh, more appropriate prizes, not hard candies, things like that inside of them. Um, as well as a puppet show and some worship led by our student band. So come on out, invite kids, grandkids, neighbors, whoever it is. Uh, we have thousands of eggs. The Tuesday Bible study ladies have been stuffing for us, so uh, we're, we're prepared and ready to go. We're excited for that opportunity to, to share the meaning of Easter with kids, as well as give them some candy and have fun. And then Easter is next Sunday. Uh, it's come up quickly, but, uh, and it's hiding out here in spring break week for a lot of us, but it's going to be an opportunity to come together and remember Jesus rose and what it means to encounter him. We have three services next Sunday, uh, the regular 8.30 and 11 o'clock. We'd love for you to come to either of those. Uh, then we also have a 9.45 family service in the middle. The 9.45 family service is geared especially to allow kids uh, in high school and under to be able to be in the service, making noise uh, and, and guided along in some activities. So whichever service you pick, that'll be a great opportunity to worship together on Easter Sunday. Pick the one that's best for you. We do ask if you're able to park a little further away, uh, especially with m probably more uh, guests and visitors coming to church or, or guests from out of town. Uh, if you're able to park in the chalet building over there, that would be great, or in the, the gravel off to the side. Even across the street, if you feel adventurous crossing the road on a Sunday morning, uh, we'd love for the opportunity for a lot of parking spots to easily be found for anyone checking out Skokie Valley for the first time. We also appreciate your ongoing generosity at the church to allow us to carry out our mission of equipping and unleashing cultures and generations to authentically live out the gospel everywhere. On the screen behind me, you'll see some ways to give. Online's always the easiest. There are boxes in the back as well. Um, we're just so thankful for the ways everyone gives of their time, talents, and treasures to enable us uh, to carry out that mission. Uh, will you pray with me now over that? Lord, we thank you that you are a, a giving God who... Uh, we remember at Easter you gave your son to die on the cross for us, who rose from the dead so that we no longer are held by the power of sin over our lives, uh, but instead we have new life in you. Uh, we encounter you and we are changed forever, God, and we're so thankful for that. We just pray that uh, you would bless our giving of our times, our talents, and our treasures as we seek to serve you, to give you glory, and to advance your kingdom here on this earth. And we pray that you would use them mightily for your glory and for many to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Won't you please stand as we continue in worship.
Let us pray. Our living hope, we bless you this morning. We've come to shout Hosanna unto your name, the King of glory, the King of kings. Our heroi, the God that sees us. Father, we worship you, O God. Hallelujah unto your name. Hosanna unto your name, King of glory. Thank you, O oh God, for saving our lives. Thank you, our merciful Father. You are gracious, you are kind, and you're glorious. We bless your name, O oh God. Lord, we pray as pastor comes up, O oh God, we pray for your wisdom upon him, O oh God. And we pray, O oh God, that the word, O oh God, that is going to be set forth, O oh God, we accomplish the purpose for which you sin. We bless you, O oh God. We pray for your power and your anointing, O oh God, in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Amen. So good to be together today as we get started this morning. Again, we're beginning, as Pastor Ben said when, when he came in to give announcements, this is our week. I mean, of all the weeks, of all the weeks on the calendar, this is our week as Christians. We celebrate uh, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection, and I hope that you'll find time to connect during this week. Uh, you remember, might remember last year we, we did some different things. We had that, that uh, Last Supper reenactment on Thursday. Uh, of last year. This year, we'd like to try something different. Um, uh, Alexander and Ben and myself, uh, as the three pastors in the church, uh, we are inviting you as the congregation to join us in a fast, 48 hours uh, from Wednesday uh, sundown until uh, Friday evening sundown, beginning 
um, during our prayer meeting. Of course, you don't have to come to prayer meeting to fast, uh, but beginning basically the time of prayer meeting on Wednesday, which we have prayer meeting every Wednesday evening right here to my right in this back room. So Wednesday uh, sundown through um, uh, Friday sundown. And Friday, we're going to close that fast with communion together here during our Good Friday service. If you are new to fasting, if you've never fasted before, there's a, a, a letter, some instructions that I've left at the information desk, at the welcome desk out there. Um, there are plenty of copies. Take one with you. And then I'm going to email the same thing out to the entire congregation uh, early this week. We have um, Zoom sessions set up for prayer meetings on Thursday, uh, a Zoom prayer session at 7 a.m., 12.30 in the afternoon, and then another one at 7 p.m. Uh, with each of the three of us pastors. It would be a real privilege to walk into, again, the, the, the weekend that changed the world, to walk into that weekend with some clarity about the things that are most important. So uh, you can fast from a variety of things that, you know, a food fast is, if you've never fasted before, a food fast for 48 hours is not an unthinkable thing, but you want to be careful, if, especially if you're on medication, make sure you're careful with that. Um, but there are all sorts of things that you can fast from, including the internet or social media, or uh, just don't fast from like uh, taking care of your children and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, I remember uh, one of my children said, I'd like to celebrate Lent. I'm going to give up science class. I said, I don't think that's how that goes. Uh, and I, yeah, I had a conversation with her science teacher. Now I understand why. So, uh, <laughs> And he doesn't watch our services online. Anyways, here we are. By the way, we have a youth pastor that loves fire. Can I, can I pick on your love for fire for a second? So um, back in 2020, you remember it was COVID year. Sherry is not in the sanctuary, so I'm going to pick on her too. Uh, do you remember that, 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 that uh, Christmas Eve service that we had in 2020? Beth, you remember? Super cold. It was like below zero, and we were all bundled up like mummies in the backyard. And I remember, Ben, you wanted to have fires all over the backyard. So many fires that we thought the fire chief was a pretty religious guy because he came to our service. <laughs> I think it was because he wanted to make sure that we didn't burn down the neighborhood. But uh, nonetheless, fires. I want you to think for a moment about the difference between a fire pit and a forest fire. See some pictures there on the screen. The difference between a fire pit and a forest fire. A fire pit has a fire that's contained in a very small area, whereas a forest fire or a wildfire is, is difficult to contain. A fire pit is controlled with measured fuel couple of pieces of wood, or uh, if you're in the north suburbs, a little bit of gasoline to get that thing going, right? And a wildfire is un uncontrollable. It just consumes fuel wherever it finds it. It just continues as it goes. A fire pit is quickly extinguished. At least we hope so. You just stick a little water on there, pull out the hose, and it's done within seconds. Whereas a wildfire is almost impossible to extinguish before it just burns out. The largest wildfire recorded in history occurred during one of the hottest known summers when blazes on the taiga of the eastern Siberia region spread and destroyed 55 million acres. Can you imagine 55 million acres? That's twice the size of the state of Illinois. That's a huge wildfire. Our text this morning is the story of a wildfire. It's the story of the contagious faith of an unlikely follower of Jesus. If you have your Bible, let me encourage you to open to John chapter 4. We're going to look at 45 verses. It's a big text, which means that we're going to be efficient with uh, how much of the story that we actually read as we go through it. But this is a great story, the story of uh, this Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, the first 45 verses, John tells us the story of Jesus' encounter with a woman from Samaria. And the story gives us a glimpse into how the gospel, how the message of Jesus, the message of salvation, the message that God has come, the message of the incarnation, the message that God has come to the rescue, this story gives us a glimpse into how that story crosses barriers and brings eternal life to the most unlikely people. People far from the typical reach of religious people. Friends, if you're here this morning, it's going to identify all of us as relatively religious people. There are people for whom the gospel is still very much out of reach, and they're not sitting in the pews 
or the seats this morning. Thrust into the margins by every aspect of this woman's identity, this Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus is so pure and so genuine and so authentic in her mess. Convincing, so convincing is it, that a whole community of people choose to follow Jesus as well. Again, it's the story of the contagious faith of an unlikely follower. So how is this relevant to us? One of the greatest tragedies in the world of Christendom is our unending proclivity to institutionalize the gospel, to build a fire pit. We build a fire pit, and then we tell ourselves that this is a wildfire. As if by instinct, we reduce being Christian to building buildings, to reinforcing moral codes, into a very perverse form of spiritual elitism. Yet the true gospel, as we see within our text, the true gospel is unbounded, permeating the world, bringing life to the most unlikely of people, spreading like wildfire through unlikely followers. My intent this morning is to simply tell the story as we go, the story of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. The story, again, is lengthy, so we're not going to read every verse. However, as we go, I want to call attention to key statements, key verses, key phrases in the text that help us hear the story in its significance. So our story, John chapter 4, opens with Jesus and his disciples. They're making a three-day journey, a three-day journey from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, a three-day journey by foot. According to verse 4 in our text, verse 4 reads, Jesus had plans. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. Now, if you are familiar with Scripture, you know something of the history. Let me tell you just a little bit. Samaria had a long history. In 722 B.C., 722 years before Jesus, the Assyrians, we've got a lot of Assyrians in our church. I know that, so I've got to be careful what I say about Assyrians. In 722 B.C., the Assyrians captured Samaria captured the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, and resettled that area with foreigners. So the northern kingdom of Israel was captured by the Assyrians and resettled with foreigners, foreigners who commingled, intermarried with, with, uh, with, with Israelite families. So Israelite families marrying with foreign families under the, 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 the occupation of the Assyrians. And the remaining population, the remaining people that lived in that land, uh, those people were cut off. They were cut off from Jerusalem. They were cut off from uh, the, the different things going on down in the south and Judah. And the remaining population, uh, they were Jewish, but only partly Jewish. And so they developed their own version of religion, of the Jewish religion. In fact, they, they accepted the first five books of the Old Testament. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. They, they, they adapted the first five books of the Old Testament and kind of rejected the rest. And that population developed, again, its own version of Jewish religion, even building a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. A temple which was eventually destroyed from, by the Jews from the south about 100 years before the birth of Jesus. So it's almost like a, 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 a different religion, partly Jewish, that developed over the, cor over the course of almost 700 years uh, up in this northern area. Now that area, again, Jewish but not really, Jewish religion but not really, Jewish practices, but not really. Those people are the Samaritans. Those are the Samaritans. And the land itself had a long history because the land was once a part of that promised land. Uh, verse 6 in our text tells us that Jacob's well was there. Jacob is that patriarch from the book of Genesis. Jacob's well was there along with a plot of land that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. So this is a significant place. In fact, after the Exodus, after the Exodus and the book of Exodus, those, those years that the Israelites spent in Egypt, Joseph's body would eventually be buried in the very same area where our story takes place. Joseph the patriarch's body would be buried about 100 yards from where our story takes place. So you can hear the significance of this, this, uh, this, this geographic space where the story is happening. Jacob's well is there, and that's where the woman is going to meet Jesus. Jacob had given a, a plot of land to his son Joseph, and then Joseph's body was eventually buried there after the exodus. 
Again, this was a place with history and traditions, perhaps even some encrusted entitlement built up over the centuries because of religious traditions of the past. Entitlement built up because of religious traditions of the past. Many years ago, I, I traveled to uh, a couple of different sections of Europe. And when I travel, I, maybe it's an occupational hazard. When I travel, where I go, I love to see churches. I love to walk into churches, especially in Europe, knowing that those churches, like we think that we've got some history in the United States, like they've got, you know, these relics, these huge, awesome churches that are thousands of years old. Uh, so again, w among the things that I wanted to do, I wanted to see beautiful churches about which I had read in church history, these places in which such significant decisions had been made, things that I'd heard about, seen pictures of in history classes. Uh, and yet as I walked into those old churches, these beautiful places, what I saw is that these places were empty. Such deep, historic places had turned into museums. The history may have been there, but the places themselves had become only artifacts, devoid of Jesus. Into the ancient artifact of a Samaritan town called Sychar, Jesus shows up. He's weary from the journey. His disciples leave Jesus. They leave their teacher by the well, this well, this Jacob's well, and they go into town to find food. You know, they're on a mission to get some food. It's 12 o'clock noon. It's the hottest part of the day. Just leave Jesus over by the well. It's hot. Don't make him walk too much more. It's the time when everybody ought to be resting. Jesus is probably pretty safe if we just leave him here. We're going to get some food. It's the time when people are resting. It's not the time when people are fetching water. That is, not unless you're trying to avoid people because of something that you see in yourself. A woman approaches and in verse 7, Jesus says to this woman who approaches him at the well, give me a drink. The woman responds, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for, for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? In just a few words, Jesus crossed so many boundaries with one request, with only the request for something to drink. He crossed boundaries and barriers that had been built up by people and traditions for so long. Jews didn't eat with Samaritans. And she was a woman. There are all sorts of like PG, well, we're going to say PG-17 types of things that were said about Samaritan women in the ancient world. Yeah, she was a woman. Jewish teachings within a generation would declare that Samaritan women were in a perpetual state of uncleanness. How in the world could a Jewish man be asking a Samaritan woman for a drink? She's asking. Think for a moment about all the boundaries we create for the sake of protecting our experience of religion. Just like the ideologies reflected in this text, we are inclined to dehumanize people who do not fit within our comfortable enclaves. Can I say that again? Think for a moment about all the boundaries that we create for the sake of protecting our experience of religion. Just like the ideologies reflected in this text, we are inclined to dehumanize. Yes, friends, we are inclined to dehumanize people who do not fit within our spiritual enclaves, and I would call this a form of religious contempt. I'm reminded of a man that I met, met many years ago in Rwanda. Uh, he was an older man who lifted weights at the same gym where I exercised. It was like, to get to the office was three miles. This is about a mile and a half between here and there, and it was a, it was a, a military gym. And the story was, in this gym, they loved to play the worst of American rap. It's not just that I don't like rap. It's that I didn't like hearing the F word over and over and over again on the, on the speakers. So I would, without asking for permission, I would go press the eject button, take the CD out, drop it into the trash, <laughs> and put in my Hillsong CD or my especially Jesus culture. I love to fill that place with Jesus culture. And I'd blare it. And one day this old man came up to me, this old Asian man came up to me and said, why did you throw that into the... The, the, the garbage can. 
and he, his, his English was a little bit rough. I said, because it's garbage. A couple of days, <laughs> a couple of days later, he came back and he didn't understand. The, apparently, there's a, there's a bit of an idiom in calling something that's not garbage, garbage. And he said, why did you call that garbage? And I described to him, I said, this is garbage because of the things that it says, the kinds of lifestyle, like the, the things that are coming out of people's mouths. I, it's awful. And this man began to describe uh, his life whenever he was a child. He says, I remember when there were missionaries in my hometown. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from the United States. I said, where are you from? He said, Korea. I said, North Korea or South Korea? He said, Korea, which means North Korea, by the way. <laughs> How profound, right there in this little gym. And he would only talk to me when the music was blaring because there was another person in the room watching his every move. And uh, we had these conversations over time, uh, and he began to tell me about how, how, how depraved his children were. And he said, I think it's because the missionaries left, because the missionaries are gone, because the Christian influence is gone. And there he was, by the way, like living in temporary housing in the middle of Rwanda, watching uh, the Christian Broadcasting Network, hearing about Jesus on satellite television. I mean, such a cool thing that the gospel penetrated this North Korean man's life in that way. Anyways, this is about the same time when Kim Jong-il died, if you remember that. Like 2010, something like that. So Kim Jong-il died, and this man, who called himself Mr. Lee, he just disappeared. He was gone. Finally, he came back after a couple of months. I, I only presume it was after they inaugurated Kim Jong-un. He came back, and I, I, I had retrieved the Bible in Korean, and I had it to give to him. By the way, I didn't intend to go this long with this illustration, but uh, second service, we have baptism, so I got a little bit more time this morning in the first service. Anyway, so Mr. Lee came back, and I remember pulling him aside, and I said, Mr. Lee, I would like to get tea with you. I have something for you. I have a Bible for you in Korean, because he had questions. He said, okay, we'll get tea. And he went away, and then he came back, and then he looked at me, and he said, your country hates my country. My country hates your country. We cannot be friends until our countries are friends. We cannot have tea. And it broke my heart that this man for whom Christ died was cut off because of man-made boundaries. Man-made boundaries. Those are politically man-made boundaries. How good we are with our Christianity in doing the same. Nonetheless, Jesus crosses those boundaries. Ha, I love the courage. Who cares? He crosses the boundaries, and he offers to this woman living water, living water. Ezekiel chapter 47, you'll see some text on the screen. Ezekiel 47, uh, written some four to 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Ezekiel 47 describes a beautiful vision of living water, and I think that is where the imagery comes from. Lots of debate about where the imagery comes from. Just read Ezekiel 47. Describes, again, vision of living water, water flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem, deep water that flows over the mountains, takes the mountains out as it goes from the temple, and it goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because it's made up of what? Salt. Like there's nothing living in the Dead Sea because that's why they call it the Dead Sea. Nothing lives there. And the water from the temple enters into this Dead Sea and the salt water of the Dead Sea becomes fresh water. The text reads there in Ezekiel 47, on the banks on both sides of that river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Where? Right there where, where death used to be. For leaves their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they shall bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Living water flowing forth from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. That's living water. Jesus offers to this woman living water. Because he comes from the presence of God. He can give it because he is it. Verse 15, Jesus is offering this woman new life. Jesus says, that he offers her this living water. And the woman says to him, sir, give me this water. Give me this water. I want this water, whatever this water is. 
In John chapter 3, you might remember the story of Nicodemus that we covered a few weeks ago. Nicodemus had wrestled with what it meant to be born again. Nicodemus wrestled with what this means. I mean, how is it possible? He's, 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 he's attacking the question about being born again from an intellectual perspective. And there's no indication at the end of the story of Nicodemus that Nicodemus put his faith in Jesus. There's no indication that he understood what it meant. Now, we can find evidence later in the book. But at the end of chapter 3, we have no evidence that Nicodemus understood. Yet this woman in chapter 4, her knee-jerk reaction is to say, if this is what you're offering, this is what I want. Because I see my desperation and I see my shame. So this woman who is marginalized, creeping in the periphery of mainstream religion, she hears it and she wants it. But the invitation to drink living water presupposes the invitation to transformation. You know, if you drink something, it's got to have an effect. If you drink something, it's going to, you know, if you, haven't, if you haven't drank anything for a long time, you drink a cup of water, it's going to revive your spirit. If you haven't had any calories in a while and you drink a cup of juice, it's going to revive your, 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 your body. In the same way, the invitation to drink living water presupposes transformation. Jesus will not leave this marginalized woman on her own. So he tells her to go call her husband. He says, go call your husband to come join us. And she tells him that she has no husband. Jesus knows that she has no husband. Do you remember the story about Nathaniel who was sitting underneath the fig tree all by himself, he thought? And Jesus said, even before, when you were sitting under the fig tree, Jesus says to Nathaniel, I saw you. Well, Jesus knows about this woman. This woman has had five husbands, and the man with whom she is now is not her husband. So Jesus knows her. Jesus knows her. But she's struggling to figure out who this Jesus is. Jesus knows her. And she says to him, verse 19, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You're a prophet because you've exposed my sin. You've exposed something about me. You, you've, you've seen something about me. He's exposed her, the, the details of her life just like a prophet would. Awareness of sin leads to concern for forgiveness. If you see me, Jesus, and I know who I am, then, 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 then that makes me nervous because I know that I need forgiveness. Where should we worship? Where should atonement be made? How do I get right? Remember, the Jews had their temple in Jerusalem, but the Samaritans had had their temple on Mount Gerizim. It was destroyed, and now with the exposure of her shame by this prophet, she wants to know how is forgiveness coming? How is atonement going to be made? And so Jesus responds, and we have this dialogue about the, the temple and about where, where worship happens. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The forgiveness offered to sinners is not contained in a building. The sacrifice of animals will never be enough. What's done in Jerusalem will never satisfy. Fullness of life, living water, that salvation that comes is not found in a building or an institution. It's found in Jesus. She declares Verse 25, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. When the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. I believe that someday a Messiah is going to come and he will rectify the problem. I believe that the Messiah will fix my need for forgiveness. He'll fix the, the shame that I'm feeling. And Jesus says to her, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Again, we need to be very clear at what the story is showing to us. The gospel is being declared to a very unlikely follower. This is a woman marginalized by her gender, her ethnicity, and even her own behavior. But take careful note of this. In spite of identity politics and hard-baked prejudices of the day, Jesus is still her Savior. Think about that for a moment. Think about all the people that you think might be too far gone. But their, their decisions about gender... Their decisions about all the different things that, that would, ethnicity, uh, their own behavior, all, the, all those different things that might jettison them or push them far into the shadows and the periphery. I want you to hear this so clear this morning. Jesus is their Savior. The faith of this unlikely follower then spreads like wildfire. 
She leaves her old water pots. I think this is kind of cool. She goes to the well to get water. When she sees about Jesus, hears about Jesus, hears about living water, she's got to go back. She leaves the water pot, not insignificant, because that old water pot has no value to her anymore. She leaves that old water jar behind, and she returns to her town, calling out to anybody who will listen, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. I mean, that's actually kind of like, really? <laughs> Her profound experience with Jesus spills over just like that into the work of evangelism. Come and see, she says. Come and see. How careful we must be to not lose that same excitement about Jesus. How careful we must be to not lose that same preoccupation with Jesus. The invitation is not, come and see my church. Come check out how cool our A-frame is. The invitation is not to hear the worship band. Well, they're good. <laughs> the invitation is to come and see Jesus. Friends, what's your preoccupation this morning? Right now, what are you thinking about? Jesus. The disciples, having returned from foraging for food in the town, want Jesus to eat. I mean, that's why they went to the town. Jesus says that he has already eaten. <laughs> I already had my food. And they don't understand. He says, verse 35, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white for harvest. I've already eaten. It's as if he's saying the whole world is, is filled with people just like this Samaritan woman. The whole world is filled with people just like this Samaritan woman. And the same is true today. People who do not look like you, people who do not think like you, people whose personal decisions might cause you to cross the road and walk on a different sidewalk, people who make you feel uncomfortable, people who you think don't belong, illegal, illegitimate, illicit. But Jesus is the very same living water who brings life to all people. It is the privilege of us who follow in the footsteps of Jesus to bring the gospel to the most unlikely of places. John closes the story by telling us that, verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Many Samaritans. Ha! More of those kinds of people? I don't know if I feel comfortable with the church anymore. More of those kinds of people. The contagious faith of an unlikely follower. To the extent that the town people approach the woman, they come to the woman, they hear from the woman, and then finally they say to her in verse 42, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know indeed that he is the Savior of the world. Huh. This is a gospel movement to be imitated even in our day. Have you ever heard of the nuns? Not the N-U-N-S. I mean, we all know, you know. Not those nuns. The N-O-N-E-S. The nuns. In January, the Pew Research Center published a study of religious nuns. N-O-N-E-S. Those who, uh, who, who, who really don't necessarily have anything that they believe in. According to statistics, 28% of U.S. adults describe their religion as nothing in particular. Nuns. Nothing in particular. 28% of Americans. They believe in God, but they do not attend church. They are critical of organized religion. Friends, they are watching us, and they are critical of what they see here. Many having had the very same experiences in church before, and they have left. They are religiously, not unaffiliated, they are religiously nuns, believing in nothing in particular. The point is, the point is, they are not here. They're not here. They're out there. They're out there at the wells. They're out there at the wells. Jesus went to the well. 
This is the story of the contagious faith of an unlikely follower. Jesus crosses the barriers and he brings life to the most unlikely person, a Samaritan woman. And then that woman, having had such a genuine, authentic, convincing experience with Jesus, brings her testimony to the community. And just like that, the whole community starts to follow Jesus. We need to be so careful in the context of church to not fall into the trap of erecting barriers that keep people from Jesus. So before we close, I just want to offer a few points of application. Sometimes people say, Pastor, boil it down. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. Let me just give you a couple of points of application, some things, some questions, some ideas for you to think about in your conversation with God. I hope you walk away from Sunday morning, have a conversation with God. Not just with the, you know, your, your, your uh, car mates on the way home, like, that was a terrible one today. Have some time with God and process this. Number one, see your own unworthiness. This woman's excitement to tell others began with a very deep awareness of her own unworthiness to receive Jesus. When she returned to her village, she did not take her old pot from the well. She went home with living water, the message of Jesus. We must carefully, carefully, carefully guard our own sense of awe for what Jesus has done for us. Do you remember who you were? It's so easy to fall into a place of spiritual elitism. Be careful. Be careful. You didn't deserve this. I'm looking around. I'm telling you, you did not deserve this. He found you at a well. He found you at a well, too. So number one, see your own unworthiness. Number two, root out spiritual elitism. Spiritual elitism is the belief that our form of spirituality is intrinsically better. The greatest barrier to the gospel is elitism, by which we make secondary issues primary and our cultural version of Christianity preferable. And then finally, number three, just another takeaway from this morning, something I hope you'll process. Look for faith among unlikely followers. Will you go to Jacob's well? Will you go to Jacob's well? You know, think about it in terms of degrees. You might say, well, there's a well in my neighborhood. That's, that's fair. But Jacob's well was crossing barriers, boundaries, into the places that were, were deep in the shadows, People that would not hear otherwise. Are you ready to go to Jacob's well? Are you ready to go to Samaria? Are you ready to go and talk to the most unlikely of people? Are you ready to go to those people who make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Friends, if you're not going and if I'm not going, who in the world is going? I know we can, we can send money. I mean, we, we're, you know, we, we've got a nice budget here at the church. Let's just write checks. We're, you know, there's a whole culture of like, I'm just going to write a check for that. No. We don't send, there's no, there's no P.O. box for Jacob's will. We go. Who will seek those who are not seeking Jesus? Let us not be found guilty of cutting off anyone for whom Christ died. The contagious faith of an unlikely follower is like a wildfire, a movement that can't be stopped. I opened with the illustration of a fire. Let me close with the illustration of water. The Mill River Dam in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, was constructed under lax regulations with shoddy workmanship. On May 16, 1874, the dam failed. 600 million gallons, that's a lot of water, 600 million gallons of water flowed for eight miles, taking out houses. Can you envision the power of water flowing downhill, taking out everything in its way? The contagious faith of an unlikely follower, a community of people who get it, a community of people who are going to the well, not the convenient place, but to the well in Samaria, a community of people like this, like this woman, like Jesus who went, is like the water flowing from a broken dam spreading into every little crack and crevice as it flows. And so living water spreads to those who need it the most. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to read and reflect on this story about the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Oh God, your word, may it be alive and active in us today. Forgive us, Father, for, for the, the ways in which we can get so comfortable with what we do, especially this week, Lord. We can get so comfortable with church that we forget about the cross. We forget that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Father, would you motivate us? Would you inspire us? And would you send us to the people who need to hear most? 
We bless your name. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you please stand as we respond in worship? Just a few things as we close our service today. After the second service, if you're interested in the Holy Land pilgrimage for next year, uh, that would be 2025. Yes, a year from now. Uh, but these th kinds of things are planned far in advance. We're going to have a special session with Dr. Paul Wright in the back room over here where his Sunday school class normally is, the very back of this hallway to my, to my right, your left. Um, after the second service, you're welcome to come. If you've never heard about this before and you're interested, you're welcome to come. If you have heard about it and you have questions about, you know, what's happened in the, in the, 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 the Middle East in the last months, 
and how that reflects on this trip, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So be sure to prioritize <clears throat> that this afternoon. Uh, additionally, SurveFest, you can sign up in the lobby. Uh, I should have received the postcard this morning, uh, but you can take a postcard if you didn't, and then you can sign up to get involved with SurveFest. And um, yeah, that's it. Finally, uh, we do have some baptisms in the second service. Uh, a few folks, um, Emmanuel Gomez and Sarah Mugford. And so it's exciting to come alongside of those folks. So if you'd like to celebrate, you can watch the, the second service online. Uh, let me read the benediction, and then we'll be dismissed. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah.